Good evening, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be a massive edition of Tuesday Night Live. Tonight, episode five, we've got tons going on tonight, and joining me, as usual, uh, the Motley crew. Pete, how are you going, Peter? Good, Fane. How are you this evening? How's everybody? Very well, very well. Uh, Nikki, how are you? <laughs> Much better than I was last week. Good I to can hear. actually speak. Good to hear. That's always a bonus. Um, and Macca, how are you doing, mate? Yep, fighting fit, mate. Raring to go. Fighting fit, raring to go. Well, then, without any further ado, let's get into some news, shall we? Well, massive news, so I guess, uh, all, all, all around for the Crows this week, and mainly arising out of the uh, the under twenty three trial game, which was a a really good uh, view. If we all, um, probably actually, one of the one of the really really good things that came out of that, I thought, was just how good the uh, the vision was, and um, just how well AFC Media did in getting that streamed out to everybody. I, I, I'm sure that everybody enjoyed that. Um, so congratulations to the AFC on that. I know that the uh, couple of the tweets that I saw, they were pretty happy with themselves, and it was a uh, it was a good coverage. And so that's probably broken some new ground for the AFC. So hopefully, we'll see uh, as uh, uh, as they go on, we'll see some more um, live streaming. <coughs> excuse me, from them. So that was a uh, that was good. The result itself was uh, probably immaterial, and uh, of course, Port got over us in the end. But uh, I thought it was a pretty good. Uh, trial game and pretty good hit out uh, for a lot of the kids to uh, um, to uh, get some air in their lungs and get a few kicks of the footy. What did everybody think? Well, I thought the big thing was that Brad Crouch uh, uh, he he started off uh, fairly slowly and just as, as the game went on, he warmed up and uh, by the end of the game he was you know almost dominating. I thought he was fantastic actually, uh, and uh, it looks like he and he's come through pain free, which is uh, the most important thing. So I think uh, the big thing out of it was that uh, it, that's that's like getting a, an A-grade player, a top player, uh, an extra player that you didn't have last year ready to go. And so uh, I was delighted with that in particular, along with many, many other things. I hope you're touching wood when you say that, Mac. <laughs> yeah, I know, where you, I know where you're coming from. History History's not a, on the side of what I'm talking about, but um, let you know, surely... Surely we're going to have a year where everything goes right. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Famous last words, mate. Come on. <laughs> I know, but you've got to say something. Um, how was just, it? How... Sorry, Nick, you go. Yeah, I was just going to add into your comments you made earlier about the stream, Pete, that not only was the stream good, but so was the commentary. To, um, Tom, kudos to Tom Wren and Mark Bickley. That's actually what we want to hear. We don't want big personalities or whatever. And it was great actually having the, the players um, for the, the two halves as well to provide, you know, a little bit of context and a little bit of news about their, their own teams respectively. Um, but I really enjoyed the commentary as well as um, the, the vision that we actually got, which was pretty damn good. I was going to say, how, how, was the, uh, the, how was the last quarter candy from uh, Ned McHenry? <laughs> He, he, is, caught. he went once. He went once too often to the well, though, didn't he? he? But it was pretty good. Yeah, he did get rid of it, though. He got rid of the ball. Yeah, he did. He got caught, but um, I think uh, he'll just learn a little bit about the uh, the step up in class. But uh, gee, it was a it was a good bit of candy first off, wasn't it? Yeah, it's it a nice little glimpse. Yeah, it was delightful. But you can't tell the same piece twice. That's what he found out. <laughs> uh, but I thought that in in terms of uh, other other things to stand out in the game, I thought Stegman McCadden. Uh, both of those boys look good in uh, in the forward lines. They slightly they play slightly differently. Uh, Stengel is um, you know, like a vacuum cleaner, just sniffing up everything uh, at ground level, and uh, and he kicked four goals. And I thought he probably has got his nose in front for a spot if there is a spot available. Uh, McCannum, who uh, I see I read an article I think it was today uh, that he he said he needs to uh, build up his motor a bit more. But I thought uh, he certainly showed he's got the quality to become an AFL footballer and he might have to wait a little bit uh, before he gets his chance. I thought Charlotte halfback flank did very well. Uh, and I think he's, unfortunately, he's in a spot where there are so many good players vying for that position that uh, he's going to have to wait his turn a long time down the track, I think. Um, and with the, the two uh, big picks, the first uh, rounders, uh, 
I thought Jones had his moments, but McHenry probably had a lot more moments. And uh, yeah, and you knew Pete mentioned his candy, but I thought um, both boys might get games towards the end of the season. But uh, I think McHenry probably the most likely at this stage. Um, my just one little knock on the pair of them is they both thought they had more time than what they actually did. Good point, um, Nikki. And it was and it was a really good wake up call for them. And I think that's what kind of shook Jones a little bit at the start because he was trying to compose himself. But I do have to say that pick up one hand um, when it, um, from McHenry, because even though the port player was in the clear to take an easy mark in defence, there had been enough pressure that it was implied he could see a player coming towards him, knew it was that quick little bugger, now, dropped the mark, and just that rove pick up with one hand and I have um, to, the little snap. I have to pull you guys up. We've, we've morphed right into match talk here. What happened to the bloody <laughs> news? That's Let's, the news, mate. It's pretty, well, it's here's, back. here's some other news. I know there is we've news, got, but it's we've got Pete. we've got three <laughs> <laughs> we've got three women in the t- team of the week this week, uh, which was excellent yeah, to good. see. Um, Alan and, should have been in there. Well, you could argue absolutely, but Jess Foley certainly earned it. Erin uh, Phillips, oh, yeah. obviously, um, and Daniel Ponter actually got nominated for the Rising Star, which I think was a um, <clears throat> a, a very uh, uh, well-deserved nomination, and of course, Steve Lee uh, in again with two goals. So uh, that was good to see. Um, what else have we got here? The Crows are announcing uh, the uh, election results uh, on Thursday, so that'll, Ooh, be, that'll interesting be interesting to see whether yeah, uh, be. whether the Crowcast end- oh, did we actually endorse anyone? I don't think we endorsed anyone in the end, but no, uh, I think we we're no, very right. fair. I thought we we're very fair. Um, so uh, good luck to those three gentlemen. Um, in the broader um, AFL news, it looks like Mark Murphy's back for uh, Carlton, which uh, will give them a bit of a boost. Uh, Tom Boyd's out, though. Yeah, Boyd's out. Um, but uh, Jack Stevens with the news today. Jack Stevens uh, taking a mental health issue um, time away from the game. So that was. Um, you know, uh, the positive, of, of course, that always comes out of this is that it's now an acceptable, uh, you know, uh, issue in AFL. And um, so he'll get all the support that he needs, I'm sure, and be back, uh, hopefully, be back uh, as uh, the good player that he is. Is is that the... This isn't the first time for Jack Stephen, is it? Uh, I'm not sure, mate. Not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm just... I, think, I think it is. Is it? Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, obviously we wish him all the best. And you're, you're dead set right, Pete. The fact that this is now legitimate, um, or, or not a legitimate, but it, it's now recognised as a legitimate um, um, issue that players need to deal with, I think is a really positive um, uh, progression from the dark old days of maybe, you know, probably even as, as uh, near as five years ago. So um, mm, all, the, all the best to Jack. Now, I'm reading all this news, obviously, off the AFL Crowcast website. So uh, um, we curate all the Crows and AFL news on our uh, website at aflcrowcast.com. So uh, rather than go through all the different websites, if you want all the Crows news and all the AFL news, uh, you can get it all at our website. So give it a click um right now you can go back to talking about bloody uh match talk now if you like but yeah, before you do i'm it. just gonna bloody play the intro music because you know we've got a format to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've, got a, you know, we've got a format here you know <laughs> assholes <laughs> <laughs> you uh, love us i kind of I tried to be used by putting stuff in there about AFC media, but I was just too excited about it. <laughs> what can I tell you? Jesus. Uh, the, only thing I felt, the only thing that I felt I was a bit sad about uh, was uh, I was a bit um, – uh, I felt a bit sorry for Ben Davis who copped a little bit of a knee jar. It just took him out of the game, unfortunately, and he was showing some excellent signs. He was that – he was kind of playing across half forward as that hit-up player and he was just showing what he could do and what he was capable of and it just came at a really bad time for Ben. He just yeah, looked like did. he was really working into the game nicely and so um, if he, you know, he, he made good position, he took the mark, you know, without that jarring, you know, he probably goes back and kicks a goal. He's pretty reliable but, um, you know, and then goes on with it but unfortunately it jars, he misses the shot, he goes off and that's the end of his day. So that was a bit sad for Ben Davis because I think that he has got a lot to offer. He's got blistering pace. 
He, he looks uh, exciting, yeah, doesn't he? he? Looks exciting. He's just such an outstanding overhead mark. And he, he just makes such good position and uh, he plays so much taller than what he actually is. Um, so, yeah, he's he's got some real gifts and uh, hopefully uh, it wasn't too bad and we will see him back soon. Well, there's been no yeah. word from the club about the, the extent of that injury that I can, that I can find. So, um, yeah, let's hope it's just a tweak. Um, it looked like he went a bit lateral on that knee, though, so... Uh, uh, it could be a couple of weeks, I reckon. Mm. And for, for me, what it was, was, once we lost him, we didn't have Wright in the second half and then that loss of Davis out of the forward line really showed up that we couldn't quite get it down there. So whilst he may not have had a huge amount of possessions, it's that positioning he does, it's that run and um, that centre-half forward role that he was playing so well, I think was really showing up with our um, forward 50 entries we were having, particularly in that first half. Um, and Pete and I have watched him quite a bit in the SNFL and he really needs a decent run at it because the kid's got absolute X factor. L- yeah, he's spot on, Nicky, and it was great. So much talent. And um, it, it, you're absolutely spot on in the role that he played. He was really the, um, the hit-up forward. And you don't see many six-foot-two kind of hit-up type players. You know, he's... Um, so yeah, he's he's uh, an incredibly good mark for his uh, for his size. So yeah, a couple of more senior players. I thought uh, Dode, uh, he just he just, Dode, he just showed his class uh, on occasions. And, uh... He looked didn't he look ripped? He looked solid as a rock, Tom Dode. Mm. I'm, I'm I'm also very amused that um, Mackie, you've just called him a senior player. He actually does fit in the under twenty three team. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, but you know, he's so he he really just came on the scene so big and so so tremendously well. You just think of him; he's one of the established crew, and yet and you, you're right. He's he's only played a handful of games, really. Um, but and also the, uh, one loco I thought really made a real claim for a position was Keith. I thought, uh, yeah, I, I love the way that guy plays. He always looks unflustered. And he, and he looks, well, looks like he's thinking about everything he does and he's got a, a very nice kick. And I thought uh, at this stage he's got the advantage of uh, the fact that Hardigan's had some uh, problems with his knees and that. But I'd say that Keith is, at this stage is there to be displaced. In other words, he's, in my opinion, he'll be the extra tall and if anybody wants that position, they'll have to get it, they'll have to get it off of him. Well, I think what I li- what I like about that option of Keith or Hardigan was being that secondary um, call, tall defender is that we can actually look at the opposition and know is a Hardigan actually a better fit or is it Keith? Um, the fact that we've got two, and I don't know, some people do like to malign Hardigan quite a bit. Um, I, I think he does actually offer a really nice look to our back line. And I like the fact that there's the two of them, but I agree with you that Keith just has that little bit of extra speed um, and he's got the longer arms. So unless he's get caught in a, caught in a body-on-body type forward, then he's not as good. But with the leading ones, um, I'd definitely have him ahead of Hardigan. Well, the thing that I like about Alex um, over... Hardigan and, I, and I'm a bit of a Hardigan fan. Uh, I think Hardigan is still a better option against beast forwards. Um, but what I like about Alex is his ground work. His bo- when the ball's on the ground, he's he's far more reliable than than uh, Kyle. Um, and given the way the the game is being played at the moment, the ball is spending a lot of time on the ground. And I think for that reason, uh, Keith is probably someone that would be more preferred. And uh, he looks in good nick. Um, you know, and if Talia comes up as uh, we expect that he will, um, I think Keith and, and Daniel in the in the key post with uh, Dude and a bunch of runners around them is going to be pretty good. Yeah, of the uh, other uh, blokes that we really we haven't seen before, uh, Hamill's got a, a bit of a way to go before he gets there. I mean, he had some moments, but uh, as did. Uh, Butts, Butts uh, did some good things and he had some moments, but I guess every butt does. Uh, and uh, Strawn in, in, in the ruck, I thought that uh, he's carrying on the tradition of being a blood nut and, uh, and and he played very, very well, I thought. How, how long before we call Butts a whole range of names like Seymour or <laughs> he played like was, shit or like I, cracking I, me up or like, I, come on. 
Lou, I'll leave you. that up to Donkey. And it's speaking of Donkey, he's here too. Thank you. Well done, Donks. Oh, he's yes, finally right. turned up. Yeah, sorry, I was just uh, doing the reader with the with the young fella tonight. It was Nobody the cares. first time I've done it with him. No, I'm just going to say I'm, <laughs> I was really disappointed in his effort. I thought he could have played a bit more focus right at the front, um, and um, I'm a lot better reader than him, so it took a lot longer than I thought. Well, it's all down to coaching, Donkey, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Anyway, we're talking about under twenty threes. Um, well, he's, he's under twenty three. <laughs> um, now, nah, um, it wasn't the commentator Tommy Wren calling him Seymour all game during the cast. No, because yeah. there was no, another player yeah. called Seymour. Yep. So oh. our fullback is the SANFL top up, and his surname is Seymour. So we're yeah. going to have a lot of Seymour and Barts in the SANFL. Ah. Oh. Well, that's what. That's why I'm here. <laughs> 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 That's a different podcast, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Welcome back to Tuesday Night Live Late Night Edition. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> look, overall, I, I thought it was a pretty good hit out by our lads. There's a lot to like with our youngsters. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed with Chase Jones, I've got to admit. He started okay, but I felt like he needed to show a bit more. Um uh, certainly McHenry uh, looked more comfortable at the level even though he's probably not physically quite there yet but Chase just looked off the pace and, and uh, I, don't, I wasn't quite sure what role they, they had him playing. Nick, did you notice? On the wing. Do you think yeah, he was, was on the wing on mostly? The wing. Yeah, I think he was mostly on the wing so that's possibly a, a position he hasn't really played because I know he hasn't played that in Tasmania from the stuff I saw. He was mostly actually midfield forward. Yeah. Um, so I didn't see him too often actually in the centre. Um, I although I think we, oh. yeah, we did put Stengel in there um, mm. for I think a couple of them to, towards the end. He actually had a, a little bit of a go. Um, the, the one thing I did find quite funny was um, Hamish Hartlett when commenting about Strawn and Hunter and then um, Rob, and he just went, where did they get these big guys for, from? It's like, the draft. That's where we got them from. And they're not actually that injured, which is unfortunately where most of Port's um, tolls are. But I thought that was kind of funny, but he didn't quite know who these guys were. I, I felt, yeah, I, I felt Chase... I felt Chase looked like he had it, but just didn't deliver on it. It looked like a bloke was out of form. I know that sounds really silly to say about a young kid, but he just looked like he was, it looked like he might have been a bit overawed. Uh, and then when he did move, he kind of had the right idea, but was just probably not moving as fast as he should have. Um, Ned McHenry, even though he might not have the right body, if, I reckon if you slotted him round one, you wouldn't be disappointed with the effort he put in right from the get go. Um, and I reckon it'd be a little bit fun to watch. So I think. Yeah, I think- yeah. McHenry, I think McHenry is absolutely chockers full of self belief, which I think goes a long way. And 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 his body isn't quite ready for AFL football, but uh, I think he is. He, I think he showed us good signs that he'll be a good AFL player down the, down the track. And I think Chase Jones. I just think he was perhaps slightly overawed by the moment, and he also did look like he was uh, uh, caught out on the pace of it a couple of times as well. So, I think the, th- the thing that I liked about Nettie is, is the fact that, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, that he's irritating and that he tackles hard and that he gets under people's skin and that he's got a big engine. And there's all this talk about all of these extraneous things about Ned McHenry. But what I actually liked is he showed plenty of skill. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, he actually showed he's a, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a skillful footballer. And, and just with that bit of candy and also, Nick, as you said, the goal that he kicked, he actually showed he's a pretty talented player um, just to go with all of that other stuff as well. Yeah, so oh. but, uh, but to me again, uh, I reiterate, and I know that uh, Fiends uh, got fingers crossed and all the rest of it. But Brad Crouch, I thought, geez, he did some. He has, that, oh, he's got that amazing acceleration. He just bursts, and uh, it'll be great to have him back. My one little downer was I was a little bit disappointed in Rob because I thought he definitely had um, a lot of opportunities. Into, um, he was kind of winning that position battle, but he wasn't taking advantage of it fully with his taps. He did some really nice ones, which I know Phoenix highlighted on our um, on the Crowcast Twitter. But I thought there were times he could have tapped to better positions, um, and he didn't 
and he wasn't quite putting it together. But I, I am, but I did love his kick for goal. So obviously he's done some work with Matty Wright and Jason Paul Pleasure and they've fixed up his little pigeon toe because that was a lovely kick for goal. And that's his real downside was his kicking. But, um, yeah, I was just a little bit disappointed in that. Yeah, look, and the one thing they, they made the point about him was the fact that he covers the ground very well, which he did. He's got a very big tank and he was, you can see him in the back line, you can see him in the forward line. But you're quite right, Nicky. Um, uh, source for all of his uh, lack of mobility at times uh, tends to hover around that centre area and become a, a bit of a link man. And I, I think that uh, O'Brien hasn't got that aspect in, in his uh, game at the moment. And that's uh, going to be very restrictive for him to become a very good AFL player if he gets the opportunity. There's nothing wrong with his, his ruck foot so much. Um, there's nothing wrong with his tank. Uh, he's a very determined young man. But uh, he's going to have to really... It's football now. It's where to be at the right time. That's the one thing that I thought he lacked. Well, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Pete, <laughs> for uh, <laughs> kicking us along there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all in all, uh, a, a good um, a good hit out. Um, but <coughs> Nikki, oh, Jesus donkey, there's a mute button there, mate. <laughs> Sorry, bloody hell. Uh, Nick, let's talk about yes. AFLW, shall we? Ooh. Yes. Well, donkey can talk about it a little bit as well because he was actually at the game live, and. Yep. There might be some certain pictures on the AFC website which might feature a certain donkey. Yeah, a donkey and a donkey's daughter. Yeah, that's true. Um, Has uh, she let go of the ball yet? No, it's still, she's actually, she's got like this little cradle thing at the end of her bed um, and now the, um, the the ball sleeps in that and she puts a blanket over it at night before <laughs> she goes to bed. That's so it's quite adorable. So I was geeing her up for all the last quarter saying, we've got to stand here and we've got to... Um, We've got to stand here. We've got to get signatures with the pen. So she knew what the drill was. She's three, so she kind of gets it. But she also gets really overawed when when they're all going down. So um, yeah, um, um, like she, we went to the Wiggles a couple months ago, and she didn't move, even though she loves them to death. So I was a bit worried about it. But she, uh, uh, she got uh, both captains. She got Aaron and Chelsea, and then then all the other girls came up, and she got heaps more, and she made sure she got every one of them. So. Uh, it was a really good experience, and those uh, our crow ladies are fantastic ambassadors for our club because they they made sure they went and saw every fan that was at the fence. Um, they uh, they uh, they really appreciated the fact that people were there to see them, and it was uh, you really felt like it was it was a really good vibe. Uh, you know, I've done done some stuff with the blokes, and you feel like sometimes that they couldn't care less whether you existed or not. Um, but these guys really really did um it was uh, uh just on the game it was uh, uh definitely rained a bit throughout the late in the first quarter from memory um and through the second quarter uh the ground was already a bit dewy um and the dew point was pretty high so none of the moisture was point. leaving so that's why it's the yeah dew point. so that's yeah i've um so the reason why <laughs> darwin's yucky isn't necessarily the humidity it's the dew point so um that means that it has to be up to about 27 28 for the water to start evaporating so it means when you sweat the sweat doesn't actually move it gets trapped on your skin and so that means that the uh, uh the ground and the ball and that gets a bit heavy i did some investigating after um after the last game i think i had a bit of an argument with nikki about humidity um, <laughs> and 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 uh I was right and wrong. Um, so it was slippery, but it wasn't because of the humidity. It was because of something else, and that was the dew point. So there we go. Um, that's, that's, about as, that's about as much of an apology as I'll ever give out. No, I, I was wrong, Nikki, and I'm sorry. But, uh, but yeah, so that's why it was a bit slippery, and you could see that through the game. Um, I noticed that the Crow, Crows were playing a bit of a setup. They were playing up really high, um, and if they weren't taking the contested mark about, you know, 35 to 40 out, um, we were using the ball coming in pretty fast to... Uh, to do a bit of sort of the Joe the Goose stuff and it'd be a bit of a foot race between Stevie Lee and um, uh, and uh, I thought that uh, that was pretty evident, especially at the ground, just the way that we were trying to track them through the back and use the pace of our girls, which was really clever. Uh, and I think one thing about Erin Phillips that uh, um, we all know that she's a superstar, um, but one of the things she does structurally for our team is she's quite often our link person. So she has to be the person that goes to the contact, the contest to help progress the ball down the ground. 
uh, and you can really see that they sort of actually look to her and she's always looking to be that sort of play that you know, lynch sort of role and bring that thing down. So anyway, all in all, really happy experience. Uh, and if you want to go see the donkey, we're up there on an AFC article about uh, girls' participation in the sport. And um, and if you can't work out who I am, then that's your problem. <laughs> well, I have to say that watching the game, that even though the scores were fairly close at the start, I just felt we had so much control of that game. Um, and as DSG has just said, Clark can coach yeah. um, very, very much so. I'm being very impressed with what he what he's done with the team, the structures that they play to, as you talked about, Donkey. But, but also around ball ups or when there's possession, we tend to circle. So even if they try to to get the ball out, we've got it um, covered over. Now, two weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go down to the club and see the Thursday night training before the Geelong game. And it was really interesting because he was going through the drills that they were going to do at training. And he got to one towards the end. He said, okay, we're going to do this little high pressure handball game. And he then asked the squad, why am I getting you to do this tonight? And it was Mariana Radjic that immediately put her hand up and said, because they're handball happy. And he's like, yep, spot on. Now, Macca, are you watching a little green circle? I certainly hope so. (laughs) You've been told off, (laughs) Macca. You're doing so well too. I'm just sitting here. (laughs) Watch a little green circle. I've got the green circle at the moment. Yeah, because you're talking. Um, <laughs> just, just, oh my God. just to our faithful listeners, um, you wouldn't know it, but we've been going for four years and I'm still rounding these buggers up to bloody get their mic situation right. So, uh, I'm all good. Uh, anyway, you know, if we go, no- <laughs> we go another four years, he still will too. <laughs> so look, there's obviously a massive game coming up this weekend, um, like top of the table oh, clash, you would of- think. It's, a, it's going to be a hell of a test. I think Melbourne showed us that from the game on the weekend that we're actually a good chance um, to really put that, that pressure on North. Now, whilst they've got a really good forward line, they've got a really good midfield, they are a little vulnerable down back. And I think we've got um, quite a, a good defence as well to counter, and particularly because Emma King spends a lot more time up forward than she does in the ruck, Sarah Allen is actually quite a very good matchup on her, and I think she'll find it a lot more difficult than she has so far. Um, I'm really looking forward to this game. I'm not sure whether we will win. My little pessimistic side's going, it's going to be tough, and I think it will depend also on the windy conditions because it's out of Avalon Airport. Um, but... No, Overall, I think we've bloody good chance. No, I think we win it. Um, I really like the way that uh, Clark has structured the forward line. Um, he and this is not having a shot at Perkins, so uh, don't get all defensive, Nikki. But I think we were much better without her there. Uh, and oh, we, for that game, definitely. And we had a very small forward line, uh, and we had a lot of pace in that forward line. Where we had Jones, uh, Stevie Lee, uh, Mules. Um, once the ball hit the ground, we just had uh, vultures swooping on it, and that, that pace was, was fantastic. And uh, um, I thought that uh, also he uh, swung uh, Ponta from the back lines into the forward lines, and uh, she performed accordingly. Apparently, she likes to play forward much better than playing in defence. Um, but uh, her heritage came through in terms of who she's related to because she played pretty well. And she, I think you, you said that she got the... Uh... Yep, she's one of the two rising stars for this week. There's yep. an adorable video, and I am going to call it adorable, uh, where Noffy rang her to tell her, um, and they you know, they put the cameras on um, the announcement kind of going on. But what I loved best was Noffy going, you are a rising star, but you weren't that much of a star, so make sure you listen to Heidi, because she was obviously she was going through her game things, and come out and play better and play even better next week, which I thought was um, quite cute as well. Another thing about when we talk about Phillips, uh, we're talking about another level of football at in, in, at women's level. Um, not only is she, she, you know, she's got all the all the class, etc., but she's got a real brain, and um, she got a lot of free kicks on the week on the weekend. And she's in a lot of players when the ball's coming towards them, and they've got a defender behind them. 
even though they're going to be under pressure, they take the ball and they get grabbed, they get thrown to the ground. What Phillips does is if she's in that position, she just bolts just before the ball gets there. The player behind her thinks she's got the ball and grabs him. And she got about three or four frees for hanging on when she, when she really just never really took the ball. And, she and just, she's just so clever. Yeah, and, you, and you're spot on because um, we unfortunately have had to put up with some awful commentators um, in the AFLW who like to uh, – who can't actually see what you just pointed out there, Maka. And partly what it is is they panic. They don't want her to get the ball and to even have a semblance of space because the amount of damage she can do. But the one player we, we haven't talked about, um, and this is Anne Hatchard. Yeah, I was and, about, just about to raise her, yeah. And I just think her form across all four games has been outstanding. Um, she's definitely taken it to another level. Um, and I do know from the training... Um, that I went to is that um, when they, they talked about that whether our forwards had done some work with Phillips, yes, they do. They do it at the um, during some of the drills. He'll actually isolate a couple of players and send them down to do some one-on work with Phillips and learn how she actually bulks and how she actually creates that space in order to get those um, marks. So it's just that I, I think we're a very good chance uh, we've still got some tough games to go, but I think we're a very good chance to be there right at the very pointy end. Yeah, just on the head chart, though, she's got to be the most improved player in the comp, I reckon. Definitely. Guys, I think we should just give a bit of a shout-out to uh, Jason McKay on the chat if you've been following the fact that he uh, is having his 15-year anniversary um, tonight. And um, not just that, <laughs> but he's, 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 ma- he's, he's managed to take his lovely wife out for uh, for dinner and also get to the chat at 9 o'clock and apologise for being a little bit late to us. <laughs> I reckon that, that's man, what I call, the man that's is what a I star. Call, that is what I call commitment to the cause. And, Jason, you're one of our favourites, always have been, and uh, that is an outstanding bit of uh, contribution to the chat, yeah. I must say. If he could yeah, just yeah. organise Mrs McKay to come on and apologise for keeping him away at 8.30, that would be really <laughs> nice. <laughs> And he's up in Queensland, so it's a completely different time zone up there because they don't do daylight savings. It might fade the curve. i got no idea what time it is in Brisbane at the moment. I wouldn't have a clue. 8.30. 8.30? Right. Yeah. Now, speaking of time, what do you reckon, Peter? I think it's time. I think it is. Talk us in, mate. We've had, we've had some comments in the chat. Well, yeah, we are. We we we, uh, uh, we mentioned earlier that, of course, we had a um, really, really fortunate enough to have a chat with uh, AFL media scribe for South Australia, Lee Gaskin. Um, very fortunate to have him uh, pre-record the interview with us. So, Fiend, if you all got your magic buttons ready there, we might uh, intro to that uh, interview we did with Lee last night. Very good. We've got a very special guest on this evening. We're uh, very lucky to have uh, Lee Gaskin, who's, the, of course, the AFL writer for South Australia and uh, all things football. So, uh, Lee, how are you going uh, this evening? Yeah, very well, thanks, guys. Thanks for uh, having me on the show tonight. Yeah, great to have you along, and uh, we're happy to learn also that you happen to listen to a few of the podcasts as well that we put out. So good to have a, a special guest that's a listener as well. Yeah, no worries. I think you guys do a fantastic job there, so happy to have a chat about everything that's happening with the Crows and, um, yeah, see how we go. Just generally, what your thoughts are um, in terms of how we're placed and how we're, um, how we're looking as we lead up to JLT1? Yeah, I reckon if there's one word to put down it, I reckon it's probably um, enjoyment. It's sort of the, the theme I've sort of got from, you know, attending all the training sessions and talking to, you know, coaches and players. It's, you know, they've forgotten about all the crap that happened last year. That's all in the past. You know, they put that to, to bed and it's just been a lot more um, fun around training, if that's sort of the appropriate word to say. It's just been everyone, you know, you speak to is saying it's so much more relaxed than it was last year. As an, a reporter who obviously communicates with the club, are you finding that it's a lot easier to communicate this year? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Maka. Um, that's definitely the, the feeling that I've got as well. Who are some of the players that you've um, observed through the pre-season who you, uh, you're you expecting to um, have uh, have really uh, breakout seasons? 
Oh, this is probably an obvious one. I'm sure you guys have talked about him, but Wayne Miller um, just looks like an absolute beast this preseason. Like he, look, he looks, he's come back and ripping Nick, and you know, even just having a casual chat with him at the Indigenous um, All Stars Summit last week at Point Pierce, he's just in a really good frame of mind. And you know, with Brody Smith back now, and you know, Miller is running capacity is as good as anyone in the club. We've seen that in two K time trials. He looks really good. Um, I was really impressed with young Ned McHenry uh, in the trial on, on Saturday. I just thought his endeavour and his speed in the four line was something the Crows probably lacked a little bit last year. Um, you know, so I think he was really impressive. Um, and people talked about Rolly O'Brien a lot too. Um, it's probably going to be hard to, um, even with the new rules, I can't see the Crows playing two specialist Ruckman, but it at least shows that Rolly's in some really good form and good shape. And if Source does have a bit of a niggling back injury, maybe he can take a week or two off this year and know that Riley can come in and um, be a really good backup to allow Source to sort of, you know, rest his back and uh, make sure he heals fully before he comes back for the, you know, rather than sort of playing through that injury for 22 weeks. How do you see uh, the duel that's obviously going on with our small? Yeah, I think like, people have probably forgotten about Lockie Murphy a bit, but I thought he had a great season last year and, you know, obviously uh, coming off a rookie deal, came across to Adelaide as an overall from the draft, played as a development player in the sample team and was working in the club shop and yeah, I thought it was great that day. I thought he might have played like a little bit, like forward, but had a little bit of midfield time as well, which he's probably done more of his junior days, but that role that he would play would be that small forward role. Um, I thought Tyson Stengel was very impressive, obviously kicked the four goals, but his pressure was very good. Um, Shane McAdam did some nice scenes too, obviously kicking three um, and sort of touched on McHenry. He had one nice bit of play where he put a bit of pressure on Xavier Dersmer who dropped the mark, fumbled McHenry then quickly picked the ball up um, and then snapped from about 30 or 35 metres through the goal. So that's the sort of stuff obviously the Crows would love to see. There's, you know, I don't think you'd expect you know McHenry and Chase Jones to, to play straight away given they probably need to spend a little bit of time in the weight room and bulk up uh, to get rid you know, the size of AFL football. But um, look, I think Murphy probably gets the first shot given he's sort of the incumbent small forward. Um, but obviously Stengel and those other guys will be putting on a fair bit of pressure. Now, my impression watching it was, that it, was it was very much a game of two halves, was that once we took off right and then Davis getting injured, that just seemed to, to turn the game. Yeah, Matty Wright. Like, I thought he played really well too and... You know, you'd love to, if, if there was an opportunity to put him back on the list for one more year. He might be a, a uh, an outside op- an option there if there's a few injuries struck. But um, yeah, like you know, to Port's credit as well, I thought they were a lot better in that second half. Um, played some really good football, but yeah, it did seem we lost a little bit. Or sorry, the Crows lost a little bit um, once Wright went off, and there was a few of the younger blokes had to sort of step up there. Did you notice any changes in the way that the Crows were actually trying to play? Did anything stick out to you that might have been different from uh, previous season? It was, it's similar in patches, but I thought they did get slowed down at times. And I think whether that was um, a game plan or game style from the Crows or whether it was Port Adelaide sort of pressing up and applying some good defensive pressure there, especially in the second half, because sort of thought Port, and they've, you know, Port have talked about what, so I won't talk about Port Adelaide for too long or I'll get kicked off the show, but <laughs> I thought they were, um, you know, they've talked about game style all summer and I thought they were a lot different to what they were this time last year. They were like more direct and um, went longer a bit more than sort of possessing the ball. They were kicking backwards a lot last year in defence and I thought they were going more direct, whereas I thought the Crows on Saturday um, at times they were slowing down uh, and looking for, you know, taking the time to move the ball and that sort of allowed the defence to um, to get into place. But yeah, look, I think once once the Crows, once the more experienced guys come, come back in and they, then they'll probably try and play that you know, that running gun attacking style, which really suits their forward sort of running back towards goal. Quite a few of our young younger blokes um, uh, started to tire a little bit. And uh, Port Adelaide's defence was a very, very good defence. It was They had a lot of quality players back there. Yeah, a lot of those guys, you know, Byrne Jones and Dougal Howard, you know, that was sort of their backbone of their, their back line last year. So, you know, it wasn't like they had a lot of guys who were playing mainly sample football. So it was a good test for the young Crows forwards. And Speaking of defence, uh, Lee, how do you see the Crows shaping up? We've obviously got a couple of niggles down back with our key tools. Um, Alex Keith, I had in my top half a dozen, actually. I thought he played really well. Um, how, how do you see that all shaping up for round one? Yeah, I think, well, you can lock in, you know, Daniel Tarling, providing he's, you know, played some part in the JLT, he's a lock there. You know, obviously Laird, Smith, Dude. So there's four guys locked in. Um, you know, you've got Miller in that mix, whether he plays more wing half back. Um, 
you know, Cole Harding is obviously the one. Expect him to, to possibly play this weekend, coming back from that knee injury. Um, but it's probably a toss up between Harding and Alex Keith. You, you know, you know, you're right there. I thought Keith was very good on the weekend, and um, yeah, it's going to be a line ball call, I think, between those two guys as to who gets that role as a second key defender. Um, but apart from that, and sorry, the other one who um, is not is in the sort of rehab modified group at the moment is Luke Brown. Um, but I think they're, they're sort of hopeful that he'll play that second JLT game. Um, and if he doesn't, then there might be a bit of doubt in him for round one. But, yeah, he's got a bit of a – I think it's a foot issue at the moment with Luke Brown. Oh, sorry, it might be the Achilles, actually, that he had last year. So they're just sort of watching him closely and hopefully he plays against GWS next week. Lee, just on the, uh, the JLT, how do you how do you see it shaping up for JLT1 in particular? And um, just in terms of is, if you've heard much about how we intend using those uh, those two games and the spread of players? Yeah, I think, and look, looking back on how the Crows approached the two JLT games last year, I think they tried to play um, a close to full strength team in both of those matches and that's obviously why they've you know why both clubs and a lot of clubs around the league have opted to have sort of practice games or you know in-house games for their third match because you know they want to give the young guys a run realizing they want to get you know two games into probably their close to their best 22 25 players so i think they'll try and roll out all the, all the guns this weekend, so those, you know, providing fitness and stuff like that. So in terms of guys who are unavailable, you probably only got Daniel Talia, Luke Brown, Hugh Greenwood, um, and that's probably about it. Now, have we heard anything from the AFL regarding whether a, the hot weather policy is going to be implemented for that game? Because I think it's going to be over 40 degrees and it's played in the afternoon when the sun's at the hottest. So I'd expect if it is, that it would mean an increase in... Um, not only the the game time in terms of the breaks, but also in the benches. Yeah, absolutely. I I haven't heard anything um, concrete yet from the AFL, but I would imagine if, you know, we are forecasting 38, 40 degrees. Uh, I think in the past when this has happened, the JLT series, that they've extended the benches. I don't know whether it's like 26 players or something like that. Um, you know, obviously probably unlimited interchange and um, yeah, extra drink breaks during quarters and longer half-time breaks. Now, Lee, uh, they rolled out, or well, obviously in the in the trials, they've rolled out the new um, uh, rule changes. First of all, how did you see that play out? And also, have you had any feedback or comments from players who, who've played under those new rules as to how they're finding it? Um, yeah, so we spoke uh, this week to Port Defender Dougal Howard and he was obviously from a defender's point of view just saying like, you know, how quickly the ball can come out of that centre bounce or centre square area um, and as a yeah, as a back six especially, you know, he was sort of starting in the goal square as one of the defenders who had to be in the goal square alongside a forward and just saying, you know, it's pretty it's pretty tough. The ball comes straight down. Depends how he was saying the Crows were sort of changing up their, how they're lining up inside 50 because you've got to have, you know, six forwards inside and six defenders inside your forward 50. So he was saying sometimes the Crows would push those guys up near the 50-metre arc and other times they would sort of have them closer to the goal square um, and they were just trying different things. And as a defensive unit, he found that pretty difficult at times. It does open things up and obviously now, um, you know, after that, if it's a behind, then the other team can just, the opposition can then just run the ball out and, you know, take extra metres out of the goal square and you've got that guy 10 metres back as well from the from the goal square. So someone like a Brody Smith, you know, he'd take off and he can launch the ball close near, you know, centre wing nearly. So you can transition that ball so quickly the other way, um, you know, turn defence to offence so quickly. AFLX, and I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it, but um, it was, I found it was uh, interesting to watch for a, a while, but as it kept going and going, I thought it became boring. Yeah, it's, look, it was targeted at kids, wasn't it? So it was an entertainment, you know, from the, uh, you know, from when the players arrived to the NBA or star style to, you know, in their suits and skateboards and whatever else. And and then you had, um, you know, rock, paper, scissors, you know, all the players getting behind that. It was just a knot of entertainment, really. You know, it was just a boat, you know, the skills and stuff like that. It was end-to-end stuff, Bruce free footy. There was something like mean, one or two tackles the entire night. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Probably by accident. <laughs> <laughs> it was up and, up and down, you know. Players obviously didn't want to get injured. You know, it's the last thing they wanted. So it was just a, it was just a, you know, a, a night of fun football, really, with um, nothing really on the on the line. I think it was probably was that two and a half to three hours. I think it might have yeah. gone for. So it was, yeah. it was a big, 
it was a big night of, um, of football, but um, I think, you know, and also I think for, for kids that go along, and I think that was a big difference. So last year, cover the, the one they had at Highmark Stadium here where, uh, you know, the Crows are the inaugural premiers. I still remember Cole Cheney lifting that. <laughs> bed, you know, high the the there, first but, premiers. I don't, I don't want to get flippant there because I think Cole Cheney had a pretty, uh, had a very good career. So I don't want to sort of. He's uh, dead set stiff, I reckon. Yeah, I think so as well. I thought he'd probably deserve another year on the list, but that's another topic for another day. But um, so, so I thought the big difference. So last year, I thought the issue was, you, you know, kids would go along, but there was no big names to, to look at in the AFLX tournament. You, no one knew who was playing. You'd seen fringe players and first and second year guys run around. Whereas this year it worked because, you know, you had Nat Fife, you had Patrick Dangerfield, you had Eddie Bett, Jack Rewalt, you had all the superstars of the game. So, you know, you eight or 10 year olds who don't know much apart from the their favourite players, you know, they buy the footy cards and they go, Dad, I've got this guy, and they can look out and there he's running around kicking 20-point goals. Aside from the Crows, uh, well, first of all, do you see uh, a big enough improvement with a, with a, uh, a decent run of injuries for the Crows to get back into contention? Uh, and secondly, uh, who do you th- feel might be the contenders this year? Is there a bolter or do you think uh, uh, Collingwood and West Coast and those clubs, Richmond, will stay at the top? I'm probably wary of answering this uh, because I know if I get it wrong, I'm going, it's going to be played back. <laughs> 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 um, when the team, the team I tip to do well is actually already planning their trip in Bali in September. So, <laughs> uh, it's a difficult. Uh, well, let's start with the Crows firstly, and I, look, you look at that list, and it's still it's full of A graders, and it's full of really quality players from one to twenty-two. Um, so I think if they do get a good run with injury, I'm just excited to see what Brad Crouch can do with yeah. you know with a full season. I think yeah. everyone's just really keen to see what he adds to that midfield mix, and you know with his combination of inside outside that he has, and um, you know I think Source Jacobs is keen for a bounce back year, and probably the same with Eddie Betts. I think he was you know he's really admitted he was down on his form last year. So there's a lot of guys with upside, and you know we're still then talking about the Dudes and Millers and. You know, Brody Smith for an entire season. So there's no reason I think they can't be a top four side. But, you know, we talk about that and we talk about the teams that are on the way up. And, you know, we saw Melbourne get so close last year to make it all the way to a prelim, get it, then get absolutely belted over in Perth. So, you know, they've added a pretty decent defender in Stephen May to that side. So I think Melbourne will be up there again. Um, you know, you imagine Collingwood will be still pretty, you know, bitter after the how things panned out for them in yeah. the season. And you think Richmond, you know, it's clearly the best side during the home and away season. And then to, you know, really choke how they did in the prelim. Um, yeah, they'll be obviously keen to make amends. But then, you know, you can throw obviously the, you know, that's not even mentioned the premiers. But don't yeah. want to sort of write off West Coast. Well, you know, losing Scott Life, it's a big blow for them. Um, but apart from him, they've retained the most most of their side. Um, Essendon, obviously, a lot better with Dylan Shield coming across from GWS. Um, Giants, look, it's, it's hard to know when, you know, how much talent can you take out of that team before they eventually come back to the field. So I think they'll be a top eight side, but it'll be, it'll be a struggle for the for the Giants. It's hard to, you know, a couple of injuries. I think their depth will be severely. Yeah. They're not as deep as they were. So, and that was always going to be the case when you had all those first mm. draft picks go to that club. Um, but yeah, there's probably, you know, it's probably eight, ten, ten teams you can throw in the mix of the premiership, I think. Yeah. Now, at the other at the other end of the ladder, what percentage of a chance do you give us for having pick number one at the end of the season? Ooh, <laughs> oh, this is a juicy one, isn't it? This is a real <laughs> juicy one. This is the one, yeah, this is a game within a game right here. Uh, this is, they've had a couple of injuries, haven't they, Carlton? Is it, I think Sam Doherty's out again with another ACL. Yeah, he's so, gone. Yeah, he and uh, I think that kills him. Trick. Yeah, he can't take a trick. So, look, you think they're probably bottom four? You think, you know, even though, look, Gold Coast looked okay from all reports on the weekend against Brisbane, um, but they're probably, Gold Coast is still probably going to finish last. Everyone's probably tipping just for the amount of talent that's left that club and, you know, the, the players they've brought in. Um, a lot of kids, like talented kids, like, you know, Rankin and Latosius are going to be very good, but it's just a big ask for them straight away. So, look, you probably think Carlton are probably bottom four. St so, Kilda are you know, probably the ones I reckon that are the main contenders for for uh, the last place. I, I reckon they're in a bit of disarray yeah. down there. Yeah, they're talking up their list a bit, but yeah, it's hard to see a lot of um, genuine 
you know, game breakers and quality in that St Kilda. And, you know, giving five years to Dan Hanabry with the injuries that he's in yeah, as well. Yeah, big call. It's, it's a big, big call. So, yeah, I think you throw St Kilda, um, you know, Carlton, obviously Gold Coast, um, and the Western Bulldogs are probably one I'm not 100% certain on how they're going to come. Yeah. It's hard to really know what Port Adelaide's going to do this year. Uh, it's it's such a big year for them in terms of, um, you know, the pressure the the fan base is putting on them um, with obviously the co-captain decision and, um, you know, obviously missing the finals in the, in the manner they did last year, you know, dropping off dramatically at the end of the season. So, you know, Port could either be, you know, back on the top eight or could really have a stinker. So it, it's... Come on, Lee, don't sit on the fence with Port. What do you really think? <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them. A lot of, oh, it's a lot of questions with them, I think. There's, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of iffy parts with that Port Adelaide side right now. So if I'm going to, if I'm tipping right now, I'm probably thinking they're going to miss out, probably in that sort of 13th to 14th sort of position there. Who's going to win on Sunday, Crows or North? Oh. Because I reckon North. that's going to be... That's going to be the game of probably the season. Yeah, that'll be a cracker, actually. Yeah, that'll be very good. I spoke to Ian Hatchard this afternoon. She is having a great season. Lee, thanks so much uh, for joining us. It's been uh, we could just chat all night, but uh, unfortunately, no. We've got uh, you've got tea in the oven, and you've got a basketball game to play. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll let you go. But uh, it really has been brilliant to have you along uh, for a chat. As I said, we could have uh, we could have gone easy for another hour just uh, just talking football, which is what we love to do. See you guys. And there you have it, um, the uh, interview that we had last night with Lee. Um, probably all agree that was uh, uh, pretty informative. And the good news is, Pete, that uh, there's another oh, 22 minutes of that interview. <laughs> So, just felt like we just kept going and going, didn't it? Oh, well, I mean, it was great to have a chat. It was just a conversation, really. But uh, for those who want to support the Crowcast and also listen to um, the bits that I chopped out, um, which were uh, by no means uh, bloopers, they were just expanding on what we were talking about, uh, you can... Uh, uh, support us on Patreon. Uh, so go over to, you can either go to Patreon and uh, I think it's the $5 tier gets you that interview, or you can just head to our website, aflcrowcast.com, and click on the interview, which is halfway down the page in the interview section, and it'll take you to where you need to go on Patreon. So, uh, yeah, well worth it uh, because uh, it, we talked a lot about Brad Crouch and uh, a bit more about the AFLW and, uh, uh, as I said, at least another 22 minutes. Just, I mean, in terms of you know, AFL journalists, I mean, they do get such a reputation, don't they? But he's just such a down-to-earth uh, bloke. And I notice even that with his tweeting, there's nothing there's nothing sensationalist about Lee. He just, he just reports the facts. He's just sort of a bit of a... He's almost a bit of a throwback, isn't he, to uh, back when journalists were, you know, were professional and did a good job. Well, not only that, but he's obviously a fan, you know. Uh, sometimes yeah. you wonder yeah. about there was, these blokes. There was a slip-up. Well, yeah, there was a slip-up, um, but he, he just loves his footy. And uh, I often wonder whether some of these blokes are in the, like McClure and Hutchie and these blokes, even Kane Corns for that matter, are really in it for the love of the game or or for their own purposes whereas Lee uh, just he just loved talking footy and I, I reckon had he not had to go and uh, dominate on the basketball court um, we probably would have still been talking yep no I couldn't agree more mate it, oh, uh, drink up. It, was, uh, it was good fun drink up drink up boom boom <laughs> <laughs> so there you go as I said if you want to listen to the rest of that or, or the uh, the bits that we cut out head over to our website support us on Patreon we do appreciate and I've got to give a, a shout out to uh, uh, the people that have so far supported us on uh, on Patreon Michael in the chat um, Vardy uh, Megan Vay uh, has supported us all through the off season as well as has Ma Michael so we really appreciate everyone's uh, support on Patreon we're starting to get our act together in terms of inclu uh, exclusive uh, content uh, I've actually ordered some t-shirts so everyone that uh, supports us on Patreon gets a nice little Crowcast t-shirt to wear the footy um, and lots of other stuff. So trying to make it as worthwhile as possible and we do really appreciate your support on Patreon. Now, Donkey. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us about competitions, mate. 
Oh, we're going to have a competition this year. Well, if you get your act together, we will. What's going on? <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, look, thanks to everyone that's joined up so far for the uh, 2019 Dream Team Cup. Um, we have uh, we've got 10 people joined so far, so we've got another nine spots to fill. Um, Maka, you're retired now, so you can run a AFL Fantasy and a Dream Team side. We've um, we've been discussing it. We think you should join. Mate, I'm um, about three for money at the moment. Oh, well, well, just come over, come over. Uh, I should, uh, I've got the, I've set up the tipping as well, so that'll launch in the next sort of 24, 48 hours, and so everyone should come down on that. So we're we'll running the same format as we did last year. If we get, if we get another 18 people on top of the extra nine we need, we could, uh, uh, we could uh, run a second league, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and we get a little bit of banter throughout the year on the podcast, and also through. The, uh, the board as well. So, uh, yeah, guys, if you're listening and you want to play, um, um, jump on. If you're following me on Twitter, I can send out the link. If not, we can put it into the uh, we can put it into the thing on the board and maybe I can get Phoenix to put it onto the cast tonight if that's a possibility. What do you want? The, the link, to, code link to the um, to the tipping end. To oh, the, yeah, uh, if you give me, give me those, I'll chuck a post on Facebook um, and I'll also yeah. drop it in content, uh, comments as well. Uh, if people come yep. back to Spreaker down the track, so uh, and I'll tweet it out and do all the other shit. Yeah. Is now, that it, Don? There was one. Other, there's one other thing. What the reason why I laughed? Um, because I thought Donkey was going to talk about uh, the great, the great series of games that happened on Friday that I didn't even bother to. Oh yeah, no, I was making a. Lego Dragon with my son. I didn't watch it any of it. <laughs> you didn't watch it after all that. After all that bloody no, hype, you, you didn't watch it. No, no. I was, like I told you, it meant something when I was watching. <laughs> I was watching the crows turn around, and but this year they um they ruined it for me. I actually, the one person that thought there was some good in it last year was had it ruined by turning it into superheroes and super dupers. Like it was just like it, the AFL completely nuffed it. Completely nuffed it. Yeah, now the other thing, the other thing that we haven't spoken about yet, and we need to round off the cast with a conversation about this. Uh, we got a game on this weekend, haven't we? We, we do. do. What mm. Yeah, a practice game. Well, it's a JLT. Have we spoken about it yet? Practice game. We have not. Apart from just uh, getting Lee's opinion on how the side line up, we haven't really. Said too much about it, and uh, you're right. Uh, it's a it's a very significant game. It's uh, against Port, obviously in Port Pirie, and uh, it will be uh, at you know at the moment the temperatures forecast is 41 degrees. So, not sure how to be able to take too much out of that uh, given the temperatures. But um, no, it's obviously an important hit out, and uh, you know if Lee's right, then we can expect to see uh, quite a few senior players come uh, come into the side and um, try and get that. Um, that uh, side sort of in shape for for round one. Yeah, I think you, what you said is quite right, Pete. It's going to be uh, because of the heat and uh, because of the way they're going to handle, quite rightly handle the, the players, and it's going to be a, uh, very difficult to take a lot out of it. For example, I think they're talking about having breaks even within the quarters themselves. So instead of having quarters, we might have eights. So uh, just so the players don't get overheated. So And which is uh, very understandable. They, uh, we don't want players getting... Ill, Ill from uh, uh, too much heat uh, just for the sake of a practice match. So it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be difficult to get much out of it. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on there, Maka, in that uh, because of that heat, if we do get those extended benches, it means we kind of can't take as much out of the possibility of what the following week's lineup and then the round one's lineup's going to be because um, there'll be a few more players than what we might have looked at. Um, but I think the the most important thing, which um, J-Mac said in the, the the chat, is no injuries. We just want yeah. no injuries. Absolutely. Do you reckon they'll give Crouchy a rest or they re- you reckon they'll play him? They'll play him because he okay. needs that 40. Yeah, even if he only plays a quarter or half a quarter. You know. Yeah, I, I think he will play, but I don't think I think what you said is quite right, Donkey. I don't think he'll play four quarters or, or eight eights or whatever it is it's going to be. <laughs> but you know, you know, I think he'll probably you know 
at least play a quarter of the game, something like that. Well, Could, they'll have a big squad, and, and none of the guys will play probably any more than two in those conditions because it would just be dangerous otherwise. I agree. Yeah. Can we, can we just give an early Cockwomble nomination to the AFL? I think you might have mentioned this last week. Um, scheduling a game <laughs> in the middle of summer in Port Pirie. Uh, like, what the fuck? <laughs> the yeah, it's just yeah. ridiculous. I have to agree yeah, with you. And, and not at night when they're actually playing it on an oval which has lights. And it's actually oh, it's actually stupid. It's just downright yeah. stupid. I mean, in my, in my job, we get so much because we happen to do the odd outdoor activity in my job and – we just get so much, you know, education on heat awareness and and heat injury. It just we just get it drummed into us all the time. And yet, you know, they're out there playing football in it. It's just but ridiculous. It, it makes them like uh, they just pay lip service to to players' uh, well being because, you know, they've got on the bandwagon about concussion and all the rest of it, and they're trying to water down the rules so that people don't get hurt and all the rest of it. And yet, they're quite willing to send forty odd blokes out onto the ground in forty one degree heat, probably more like forty five degree heat in Perry, in the middle of the day uh, on on the back of nothing more than a pre season. Yeah. It'll be the hottest part of the day too, three forty-five. I mean, mm. AFL, yeah. get your freaking act together because if you've really got the players' well-being at heart, you wouldn't be scheduling like this. And not only that, can the AFL Players Association actually stop worrying just about the next bloody broadcast rights um, contract and actually start looking after the players' well-being because they should have been onto this straight away. Uh, they also do it in the AFLW. Because, okay, yes, we're, we're playing in that little gap as the lead-in, et cetera, but it's those hottest times of the day as well. And the Geelong game was played on a Sunday at 2.40. It was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And they're playing it at Norwood, which doesn't have a lot of um, shade no, for anybody. It's... No wonder the crowd's dropped off. You know, and they, I, and they I get... They just don't think... Yeah, and I get it, it's broadcasting and blah, blah, blah. But these are these are pre-season games that we're talking about, Nick. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, from the men's point of view, they're pre-season games that don't mean anything. They're designed to get players fit for the season. And yep. you're, you're going to see players losing so much fluid. And I would imagine there'd be a gentleman's agreement between the two clubs that, you know, we're just going to get through this day with, you know, as many players rotating as we possibly can and no one gets hurt and we just get the hell out of here. And what good is that for the people of Port Piri? Well, I mean, apart from the fact that they get to see a few players run around, well, don't they want a competitive... They're not going to get a competitive match after the first 20 minutes, I wouldn't have thought. No, I think you're quite right there, Fee. And I would say there'd be a gentleman's agreement uh, between the two clubs that uh, just use it to give the rotate players, give them a ten minute run on the ground, and leave it at that, and uh, yeah. not not to not to get too fussed about the result. So yeah. they might as well might as well just play at AFLX up there. Well, yeah, that's another conversation, Pete. What do you reckon, mate? I, I can hear that uh, you're starting to get into your uh, your nightgown and uh, get your little eggnog <laughs> happening. It's starting, to, it's starting to get past my bedtime, mate. It's, yeah, it, and you know it. Look, thanks to everyone on the on the uh, speaker chat and on the Facebook chat. It's been. Uh, uh, fantastic tonight we've had a massive show got through a hell of a lot uh, enjoy the footy on the weekend go the Crows girls against North and we will see you next Tuesday night for Tuesday Night Live again good night everyone good night all good night all, good night, all. Good night, all. Good night all.